My name is Glenn Howard. I'm president of the Jamestown Foundation. We're delighted that you're here today uh, to participate in our conference on the future of Baltic energy security. Uh, it's a very great event that we're very appreciative of your time and participation. We're also very grateful to our corporate sponsors for the conference, uh, Gas Systems and Pern. Uh, the, the CEOs of Gas System are here. Tomas Stepin is in the room. Uh, I'd like to thank him who's here as well as the CEO of PERM, uh, Igor Vasilevsky, who is also here. Uh, so we thank you very much for your support. Uh, we're also delighted to have here sitting in the front row, we have Piotr Naimsky, uh, the Minister of National Infrastructure of Poland, and we're very happy that you're here uh, as well and speaking today. Uh, it's a great honor for the Jamestown Foundation to play a role in, uh, in discussing a very important issue a uh, very important relevance to the United States and the national security and energy security of a very important uh, region of the world, of which Poland is in the center of. And we very much uh, want to look forward to the, having this fine, distinguished group of speakers here today. Um, many of these experts, like Margarita and Vlad and, and Matt Bryza, have been covering uh, energy security issues in, in Europe for, for quite a while, uh, with a special focus on Eastern Europe. Um, and so we're delighted that they're able to participate and be able to speak and share their insights. Now, the purpose of the conference, we, when we started developing the idea for this conference, was to draw the circle. And by that, I wanted to draw, I mean, to draw the energy circle uh, and identify the problems in energy security uh, that are affecting uh, many parts of Central Europe. And that discussed the options and policies for how to change those policies in terms of the energy circle and how this is changing. This was made abundantly clear earlier this year in April when uh, President of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, had a White House meeting with Angela Merkel. Uh, and in that meeting, he brought up the issue of the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, and since that meeting, it's become abundantly clear uh, that this is becoming a, um, a focus and a, and a level of attention uh, by the United States. And that is certainly reflected today by the participation of two very senior uh, U.S. Uh, government officials. We have, speaking Department of Energy, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Africa, Europe, and Middle East, Andre Waldman Lockwood, as well as joining her is Colin Cleary, who's the Director for Energy Diplomacy for Europe in the Bureau of Energy Resources at State Department. Um, so this type of a high level of attention certainly indicates that it is becoming an issue of priority and importance to the United States. Now where this conversation and discussions today will go will be to discuss not only the issues of Nord Stream but also to discuss the issues of supply. And in that process we have um, our two CEOs, Mr. Vasilevsky will be talking today um, and also Mr. Stepin about um, gas and, and oil flows and, and oil security uh, and what that means for the region. And so, but in this process, we, we need to continuously look at the, and understand the role that Poland can play in regional energy security. And part of the discussions today will be discussing the Baltic Pipeline Project. And so we look forward to a very, um, very interesting discussion of that, uh, the Baltic Pipeline Project, how it's evolving, where it's going. Uh, we have a lot of slides and, uh, um, and graphs on that that will be presented today. And so from this discussion, we hope this will become more of an issue of discussion in Washington about how, how Poland's importance in the region, what the effect of Nord Stream is going to be on energy security, and what are the solutions to this. And so when we look at the solutions, I think the Baltic Pipeline Project is certainly offering that. And, uh, and we have no one better than that than the distinguished speakers that we have on this first panel here. So I'll turn the floor over to Margarita Sienova, who's a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation. And Margarita will moderate, but also present her recent paper uh, on Nord Stream. So thank you, Margarita. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Matt, for all your um, efforts to be here today. Uh, there is no need to introduce two of the most distinguished people uh, I've seen at <coughs> such conferences in Washington. Matt Breiza, former ambassador to Azerbaijan and former State Department official who is now um, based in Turkey and working on energy issues as well. You have uh, his um, uh, bio in your files, but in your folders. But let me say uh, a few things about him. He spent 23 years uh, in the, as U.S. diplomat, over half of which was spent at the Center for Policymaking International Negotiations on major energy infrastructure projects and regional conflicts in Eurasia. 
He, uh, his most recent assignment was U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan in 2011, 2012, and between 2005 and 2009, Matt Breiser served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia with responsibility for Eurasian energy in the South Caucasus, Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus, all the places that we hope to have uh, gas to Europe sent um, sooner or later. Um, Matt is now a member of the board of the Jamestown Foundation. Uh, we're very glad to have him uh, here on the panel and on the board. Uh, Vlad Sokor uh, is our distinguished energy and uh, political experts on everything Eurasia. He's focusing his work lately in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, he's written um, groundbreaking articles on energy, uh, the Southern Gas Corridor, Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, uh, the potential for Turkmen gas coming to Europe, uh, you name it, everything that is related to um, Ru Russian uh, gas from Russian companies, Russian penetration of Europe. Uh, Vlad Sokur has distinguished a long career in analysis, uh, starting with a uh, big part of it was spent with Radio, F Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in Munich. He lives in Munich, he's here for the conference, and I will start with... Uh, Vlad, to talk about <coughs> what is Germany up to with Nord Stream 2 and why is Germany so stubbornly support the project that is so deeply dividing European countries? Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Margarita, for your very kind and generous introduction. Uh, Germany, Europe's largest economy by far, is falling into a risk-fraught degree of energy dependency on Russia based on the delusion that Germany can unilaterally profit from this close relationship with Russia at the expense of other European countries. And in this sense, Germany is becoming a liability to Europe's energy security. It, there are two twin liabilities as I see them. The other German liability is with respect to defense according to mainstream German evaluations of Germany's army, the army suffers from low combat readiness. And at the same time, Germany is the main stumbling block to the permanent stationing of US slash NATO troops on the territories of Poland and the Baltic states. So just to anticipate a little bit, I see there also an issue on which we should get more active, the issue of permanent stationing. But we are dealing with energy today. Germany's over-dependence on Russian energy, a full 40% dependency on Russian crude oil, accompanied by 45% dependency by now on Russian natural gas. The political risks and the societal risks to such deep dependency are obvious and hardly need to be belabored. Dependency on natural gas is set to grow because natural gas from Russia will replace the uh, nuclear energy which uh, Germany is abandoning. The last nuclear power plant will go out of service in 2022 and German, uh, uh, Russian gas will also be offsetting the decline in production of North Sea gas. Moreover, Germany is due to renounce hard coal for power generation, and that too is an area that will be filled with gas of Russian provenance. Current dependency as of 2017, 45%. Forecast dependency after, if and when Nord Stream 2 is completed, <coughs> dependency will grow to 75 to 80 percent. A unique case in Europe. And moreover, for, for Europe's largest economy by far. What has led to these German decisions? To emphasize these are bipartisan decisions in Germany, shared by both principal political parties. 
This policy was launched by the Social Democrat Party under Chancellor Schroeder. It was adopted and continued by the Christian Democrat Party under Angela Merkel. There are two distinct uh, German interests here, the supply interest and the transit interest. Mm -hmm. It's important to distinguish between the two. The supply interest originated back in 2003, 2004, during G Gerhard Schroeder's chancellorship, when natural gas was believed to become a scarce commodity. And Germany wanted to be at the head of the queue to obtain privileged or primary priority access to Russian gas in Siberia on the assumption that gas was becoming a scarce commodity, an assumption actively promoted by Russian propaganda in Europe, ignoring, of course, the impending shale revolution and uh, ignoring other discoveries in Europe that were uh, in the Norwegian Sea and in the North Sea that were coming up. And so the main German gas-consuming companies, BASF and Aeon Ruhr Gas, developed, together with Gazprom, a model of asset swaps and cross-investments. That meant that, I have to explain what BASF is, it is rated as the largest chemical company worldwide, and in that capacity, it's, it, has, it is a huge consumer of natural gas. Uh, the natural gas arm of BASF is Wintershall. BASF slash Wintershall. Wintershall is the procurement and distribution gas arm of BASF. While Aeon is the largest, by far, producer of electricity in Germany, again based on gas. So these two companies, jointly with Gazprom, developed a model of cross-investments and asset swaps. What does that mean? It meant that the two German companies would invest in production, development and production, in Siberian gas fields in the Urengoi Basin, and reciprocally, Gazprom would invest in quotation marks by acquiring stakes in gas infrastructure in Germany belonging to Aeon and Wintershall. And this model, which the Germans accepted, uh, it is a Russian model, which the Germans accepted, has led ever since, we are talking about starting in 2003 and continuing, has led to the development of a structured interlocking of interests between Germany and Russia. Asset swaps and cross investments create a structure, a deeply entrenched structure of shared special interests, which undermine European cohesion, undermine Germany's presumed leadership role in Europe, and create an economic basis for political rapprochement between Germany and Russia of a strategic nature. So this was the supply interest, which has been developed along these lines ever since 2003-2005. And the pipeline Nord Stream 1 was designed to transport that gas from the Siberian, not only, but including the gas developed in Siberian uh, gas fields by Aeon and Ruhr Gas with their investments uh, shared with Gazprom. That was the supply interest. Now for the transit interest. Nord Stream 2 is not primarily designed to supply Germany. It is designed to, tor to turn Germany into the principal center for distribution of Russian gas into Europe. If Nord Stream 1 was a supply project for Germany, Nord Stream 2 is a project to turn Germany into a transit country, storage country, distribution country throughout Europe, German companies would on sale, would, would, would sail uh, the Russian gas onward at a profit. To a large extent, the transit role would be taken over by Germany directly from Ukraine. 
Germany is simply absorbing Ukraine's transit revenue, taking, away from, taking it away from it, Ukraine. But Germany is also taking, the, uh, taking on addition, an additional role that Ukraine did not play, the role of storage center in the heart of Europe, and the role of distributor to other European companies at a markup and at a profit for German companies. So this is the uh, mission of Nord Stream 2, but it has a history, and the history is very interesting. President Putin first made an offer of this sort to Germany back in the year 2006. And that offer was based on the Russian gas, natural gas project at Stockmann, a supergiant field in the Barents Sea, which Gazprom wanted initially to develop it alone. It was a go-it-alone project initially. Gazprom failed to go it alone and enlisted uh, Statoil of Norway and uh, Total of France as co-investors and service providers, not as stakeholders, as co-investors and, and service providers for joint development of uh, Stockmann. And President Putin offered to Angela Merkel, uh, who had recently become prime minister, this was 2006, to turn Germany into a European hub for Russian gas based not on Ukrainian gas, not on the uh, gas from Ukrainian pipelines at that time, based on Stockmann. So that project did not directly affect East Central Europe or Ukraine, because it was based on Stockmann. The gas coming down from the Barents Sea. But Gazprom failed to develop Stockmann. Uh, the geology is very complicated at Stockmann, and uh, Statoil and uh, Total were not sufficiently motivated without uh, investment stakes. Then the economic crisis came in uh, 2008, and Stockmann was abandoned in 2009 or 2010, was abandoned. And it was only then that the Russians came up with the idea of Nord Stream 2 to bring gas and turn Germany into a hub. Now, the status of hub for gas it is a much coveted status. Gazprom has dangled the prospect of turning countries into hubs, has dangled this prospect in front of many governments, and many of them typically fell for it. And starting full of hope to negotiate with Gazprom. Gazprom was, of course, uh, engaging in a now you see it, now you don't type of game. Only Germany managed to obtain the hub status, because Germany enjoyed privileged status in, uh, in terms of Russian foreign policy. So the status being dangled to Germany was real, not farcical, as it had been in the other cases. So this was the uh, uh, meaning of Nord Stream 2, which the Russians announced that they would develop uh, very shortly after Nord Stream 1 became operational, 2011-2012. But even here, there is a further uh, uh, relevant history. At the same time, Gazprom was proposing to develop the South Stream system, the main beneficiary of which would have been Italy. Beneficiary, perhaps in quotation marks, would have been Italy. Everyone knew that Russia did not have enough gas volumes, volumes to feed both Nord Stream 2 and South Stream at the same time. One or the other. Uh, Nord Stream 2, 55 BCM, South Stream 63 BCM, design capacity 63 BCM. So it would be one or the other because the Russians would have enough volumes for only one of the two. And this created an undeclared and very little known competition between Germany and Italy over access to Russian gas. And Germany rushed into Nord Stream 2 in part out of concern that Italy might be first. So the, uh, Germany wanted to outrun Italy in the race 
for Russia's preference. This consideration accelerated the German decision to go for Nord Stream 2. But even then Nord Stream 2 was not yet a final decision because the Russians were not ready to renounce South Stream. South Stream had a second meaning also, not only to dangle it before Italy, but also to blackmail Ukraine into giving up control of the Ukrainian gas transit system to Russia under the threat that if Ukraine does not do that, it will be bypassed by South Stream. So South Stream was always a retractable project and a retractable threat. It could, be it could and was withdrawn from Italy if Germany made her decision first. And it could be renounced by Russia once it lost hope to blackmail Ukraine into giving up its control of the gas transit system. And that happened after the Euromaidan. After the Euromaidan, Russia finally lost hope of uh, acquiring control over the Ukrainian transit system. And so only in 2015 did Russia, Gazprom, reactivate Nord Stream 2. 2015. What will be the effects of Nord Stream 2 in terms of Germany's hub, European hub for Russian gas? Um, first, Germany would get to transit a full 80%, 80% of all Russian gas going to Europe. All of it would go through Nord Stream 1 and 2, 80% uh, of it would go through Nord Stream 1 and 2. Those two pipelines have continuation pipelines on land to transport over land the gas that's coming on the seabed. Those pipelines cross Germany, they are high, very large capacity uh, pipelines, and they create a windfall in terms of transit revenues for the German federal government and for the German land government. There are five German lenders that are being crossed by these pipelines. From north to south, they are Mecklenburg for Pommern, Brandenburg, and Sachsen. And from center uh, westwards, uh, they are Lower Saxony and North Rhine-Westfalen. So like the uh, federal government, so these lenders stand to earn huge revenues from transiting the gas and from storing the gas. Three of these lenders are in the former GDR and are relatively depressed economically. To them, these projects are very important. So this has created, again, a structure of lobbies that are pressuring the German government to go ahead with this and are shielding the German government from domestic criticism. Highly uh, astute move in Russian policy. Russia presents these projects as European in nature. The Germans are not so bold in describing them as Europeans. Uh, the argument of Europeanness is more or less understated on the German side. It's the Russians who come up with, in the boldest way with the argument that these are uh, European uh, projects. In fact, these are anti-European projects, in my view, because they would simply explode the European Union's common energy policy. They explode it from within. They contravene the uh, EU's third uh, package of energy market legislation, which provides for an integrated, unified European energy market. Instead, these markets create a huge self-contained hub in the middle of Europe, in the heart of the European Union, 
and the number of pipelines under a shared controlled by Gazprom filled with this gas. So this negates the concept of an integrated European market under European legislation. European legislation signed, co-signed and approved also by Germany. These projects also contradict the European Union's competition policy and policy of energy security because those policies presuppose diversification of import sources, diversification of transportation routes, whereas the system that's now be put, being put in place means one monopoly supply uh, import source and one single transportation route going to one single destination. So this is the very opposite of the European Union's policy of competition, supply security, and diversification. Again, policies signed, co-signed, and officially endorsed a few years ago by Germany. That's why I'm saying that these are anti-European projects. Notwithstanding the tremendous political and strategic implications of these projects, which are Europe-wide in scope, Berlin has not consulted with the European Union about these projects, nor with Germany's fellow European Union member countries situated to Germany's east. In fact, Germany has... Uh, treated these projects as a done deal. From Berlin's point of view, it's a done deal. These projects will lock in the German gas market, again, by far the largest in Europe, before US LNG becomes price competitive. It would also result indirectly as a practical effect in German gas consumers co-financing, or rather contributing to the co-financing of Russia's military programs and of Russia's hybrid conflict undertakings against Western countries, including Germany, including hybrid conflict undertakings from within these countries. Gas revenue will enable Russia to sustain these policies. And notwithstanding these tremendous uh, implications, there has been over the years so surprisingly limited debate in Germany about these projects and about their consequences. The debate has picked up a little bit in the last two years or so. But until, and even now, the debate is very subdued, and it is carried out mainly at the elite level. There is no debate in parliament, no debate by political parties, no positions assumed by Germany's political parties, except for one, which, and I'm coming to it in a moment, so although Germany uh, prides itself on its culture of debate, in fact, Germany is so fixated on debates that all too often debates takes the place of policies, last forever, without or with little policy results. But this has been a special case. Now I'm going to outline to you who is for and who is against these projects uh, in Germany. By far the most important or the most active moving force is the Social Democrat Party. Uh, this party is now, in terms of political strength, it's a shadow of its former self, from 40% in, uh, in its uh, electoral scores, it's now down to 17, 18. So it's less than half of its previous electoral scores. It has shifted very much to the left. But this party is the most vocal in promoting uh, Nord Stream 1 and uh, Nord Stream 2. Angela Merkel's Christian Democrat Party is completely behind it, but 
silently, discreetly, non-ostentatiously. Merkel, for sure. Merkel could have stopped these projects since, ever since 2006. Within, the, within Angela Merkel's party, however, there are a few individual figures, major figures, but they are individuals, who came out against this project. They are Norbert Röttgen, the chairman of the Bundestag's Foreign Affairs uh, Commission, and Manfred Weber, the head of the European People's Party, uh, German Christian Democrat, uh, uh, Christian Social Party, uh, the head of the uh, European People's Party group in the European Parliament. These two politicians have come out publicly against Nord Stream as individuals. Uh, Weber did so in 2016, not since, but in 2016 he did so very firmly, and by the way, together with a Polish Europarliamentarian, uh, Mr. Sariusz Wolski. Uh, Röttgen, head of the Bundestag's uh, Foreign Policy Commission, uh, from time to time, uh, with some regularity, comes out against Nord Stream. Uh, the Free Democrat Party, liberal, for short, does not have a position on it. The Alternative für Deutschland does not have a position on it. The, the Alternative für Deutschland, by the way, does not have a foreign policy. This is important to realize. Alternative für Deutschland has no foreign policy. Against the uh, Nord Stream are the Greens. And I believe that they are uh, uh, vocally, they are vocally against, uh, against Nord Stream for two reasons. Because uh, Nord Stream would add to the carbon economy, although low carbon, it's low carbon, but still it's an addition to the carbon economy, but primarily for ideological reasons. The Greens has become in the last few years by far the most anti-Kremlin party in Germany. And they oppose the extension of Russian political influence in Germany through the means, medium of Nord Stream or through other medium. On the whole, the German liberal left has turned against the Kremlin in recent years. And this is important to realize because if you, as Poles or as Bolts, uh, ever decide to get active in Germany, and I think you should, then you should figure out who your allies might be. The German liberal left, who traditionally was in favor of good relations with uh, Russia, has turned against Putin's Russia because they perceive Putin as the champion of European conservatism. So the left is against Putin. You can see this in the coverage of Der Spiegel, of the Zeit, is the way they cover uh, Nord Stream. Always against Nord Stream has been the right of center elite press. Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, Die Welt, and the, and the popular uh, newspaper Bild. These are traditional right of center papers and they've always been against uh, Nord Stream. To repeat, it's important to try to map out your possible allies in Germany if you decide to get active in Germany. German uh, business integrity is rightly famous, yet, Persons like Gerhard Schröder or the Stasi, uh, former Stasi officers who are involved in Nord Stream, such as Matthias Warning and not only him, have neither been ostracized in German society nor investigated. They operate freely as if they were normal market operators. Why, why was I saying that this is an anti, uh, I explain why this is an anti-European uh, project. And this fact is also reflected at the level of the European Union in Brussels. Against Nord Stream are the European Commission, which is trying to find out all kinds of policy obstacles and legal obstacles to hold Nord Stream. The majority in the European Parliament is against Nord Stream. And most member states are either uh, uninterested or firmly against. 
firmly against are about 12 or 13 countries, firmly against. Those in favor are four. Germany, Austria, France, and the Netherlands. There are four. <coughs> Romania is about to take over the presidency of the European Union, that means of the European Council, uh, on January 1st. Romania will be faced with a task of accelerating the consideration of amendments to the third energy package submitted by the European Commission. Uh, these amendments would enable the European Commission to subject to European legislation not only onshore pipelines, but also offshore pipelines. These amendments have been pending in the European Council since, 2000, since the fall of 2000. 17. But the two presidencies, first Austria, no, first Bulgaria, then Austria, slowed down the consideration of these amendments. The slowing down of the consideration process enables Gazprom and its German partners to go ahead with construction offshore before European legislation can be amended to apply to offshore pipelines. So Romania now has an opportunity to accelerate the consideration of these amendments in the uh, European Council. And I suppose that countries such as uh, the Baltic States or Poland could use the excellent relations they have with Romania to urge Romania to proceed with this consideration as president of the European Council. Germany may come to experience the same effects of over-dependency on a single supplier, Russia, and on a single supply route, Russia, the same effects that the countries of Eastern Central Europe have long experienced. From the point of view of Eastern and Central Europe uh, countries, the Russian supply monopoly would be replaced by a combination of the same Russian supply monopoly plus German distribution monopoly. Because the same uh, gas of Russian provenance would reach Central Europe via the Baltic Sea, via Germany, via the Czech Republic. And those pipelines filled with Russian gas would not allow countries in Central and Eastern Europe to access their own supplies, with the exe partial exception of Poland, which is building an alternative supply route to Scandinavia. And in this process, Germany is taking away transit income from several Central and East European countries. Had Berlin acknowledged that Nord Stream is not simply a commercial project but has political and strategic implications, then a discussion, political discussion, in Brussels, in the European Parliament and the European Commission could not have been avoided. The thesis or the tenet that this is a simply a commercial project is meant to avoid the necessary political discussion about the political implications. In April of this year, Chancellor Angela Merkel acknowledged for the first time while meeting with President Poroshenko that uh, Nord Stream also has a um, political aspect that needs to be taken under consideration. She referred exclusively to the aspect of Ukrainian transit. That was the only political aspect that Chancellor Merkel has acknowledged thus far. She has not yet acknowledged the political strategic implications for the European Union in its entirety and for the countries of Eastern Central Europe and even for Germany itself. Those, are yet, those political aspects are yet to be 
uh, acknowledged. A note about uh, Ukrainian transit. Even if there is some minimal volume of transit that remains uh, in Ukrainian transit pipelines, this does not mitigate at all the negative effects of Nord Stream. That volume that might be left, with a big question mark, in Ukrainian pipelines would not be subtracted from Nord Stream would be additional Russian gas going to Europe. Nord Stream is designed for a total of 110 BCM and would remain at that. Its shareholders would undoubtedly insist on that. It's unimaginable that the partners in Nord Stream would accept a reduction of transit below 110. The overland extensions of, South, of uh, Nord Stream are also designed for a total, an aggregate of 110 BCM. Any volume that would be coming out <coughs> through Ukraine would be additional to Nord Stream 2. And of course, it cannot be guaranteed. Nobody takes Russian guarantees at face value. So a Russian guarantee would be completely worthless. And Ukraine knows this and says this. So the game is not to allow Nord Stream to proceed uh, under a concession to Ukraine. The aim is to block Nord Stream, not to allow it to proceed with a minor concession to Ukraine. To conclude, Nord Stream is highly detrimental to Europe, to the European Union, and to the states of Central and Eastern Europe. The anti-European character of Nord Stream is hidden behind a pro-European Union rhetoric. The future of Nord Stream <coughs> depends on whether or not Germany persists with it or withdraws the political support from it. Whether or not it Germany withdraws the political support from this project. The future of, South, of Nord Stream will also depend on whether or not the threat, threat of US sanctions could persuade Shell and NG to withdraw from the project and persuade European financial markets and service companies to withhold financing or services. So whether or not the threat of US sanctions would have those effects. I think those are the two major variables on which the future of Nord Stream depends. And a couple of recommendations to, we cannot wrap up a presentation without policy recommendations. This year in October is the start of the year of Germany in the United States. I don't know how many people are aware of this. This is a German public relations undertaking. <coughs> October 2018, October 2019. In my view, it is a salutary undertaking. I had long favored it because Germany is very little known in the United States. Germany is a very remote, unknown, and incomprehensible country to the great majority of the Americans, and I dare say to the editorialists of the mainstream press. So this is an opportunity, the year of Germany in the United States, is an opportunity to raise this issue with German visitors and to provoke debates in the United States. It is also an opportunity, this year of Germany, to bring this issue even more actively in the US Congress. Undoubtedly, there will be German outreach to the US Congress. This may be a core function of the year of Germany in the United States. There's another opportunity to bring up this issue everywhere in the United States, but including in the, very much in the US Congress. 
also this year, in uh, next year, in uh, May or June, elections to the European Parliament. Another good opportunity to bring Nord Stream into the limelight of European politics. Elections to European Parliament take place in all the countries, member countries of the European Union. I mentioned already that a majority in the European Parliament are against Nord Stream in the current Parliament. Good opportunity to put this into the limelight of the political stage uh, in Europe. And you can work with selected politicians whom you know that they are opposed Nord Stream to clarify your views and give them arguments. The Spitzenkandidat, that is the uh, head of the electoral list of the European People's Party, is the aforementioned Manfred Weber. I mentioned him uh, a few minutes ago who is publicly on the record uh, against Nord Stream. And I repeat, he's a friend of Mr. Sariusz Wolski. Um, you should use every uh, official visit by officials from your countries to Germany as an opportunity to raise the issue of Nord Stream's negative consequences. Not only for your own countries, but focus on the negative consequences for Germany itself and for the European Union. And I believe that your advocacy should always proceed from a European perspective, not from a nation, narrow national perspective. Even if your national interests are behind it, of course. But phrase it or frame it always from a European perspective. And also frame it with Germany's own interests at heart because you are interested also in your as a matter of na your national interest. You are interested in a viable German economy, one not subjected to Russian blackmail and pressure, and one not vulnerable or exposed to Russian corruption. So you are interested in helping Germany in this. If any... Uh, uh, if, if Berlin comes to reason, it should not be seen as conceding to Trump, never. It should be seen as conceding to the European Union. The European Commission is a key ally. Some circles in the United States, some Trumpians, are very wrong in bashing the European Union. Countries like Poland and the Baltic States and Romania and all the others, uh, they have a vital national interest in the continuation and prosperity of the European Union. And in that capacity, they can also bring American influence in the European Union. The European Union is your best, best ally, the European Commission specifically. And as you may know, uh, Mr. Shevchovic, uh, vice, chairman of the, vice president of the European Union responsible for the energy union, is a Slovak, and Slovakia is gravely affected by the shift in transit. I don't think that these uh, potential alliances have been sufficiently used until now. Make the point that any continuation of Ukrainian transit <laughs> which we all wish does not mitigate Nord Stream's negative consequences. It does not mitigate those consequences at all. And finally, work more with the US Congress here in Washington. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vlad. I think we can close the conference now. <laughs> This was such a detailed and extensive presentation that encompassed everything related to the, to the project. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of the myths that Russia uh, Gazprom is using in order to promote um, uh, Nord Stream 2. And, and I think this is very important because I listened to a German representative yesterday talking about the project, and he was repeating some of those lies or semi-truths um, that uh, Russian, the Russian company is using to promote 
uh, its project. The main reason Russia is promoting this project is for political reasons. That is going to put under its control not only Ukraine, well, which is going to lose co almost completely the entire transit of gas from Russia, but also the entire Central Europe. Um, because right now, Central Europe and Eastern Europe are being encircled by two pipelines, Nord Stream 2 and Turkish Stream. One is going uh, to be through the, Black sea, through the Baltic Sea. The other one is almost built already in the Black Sea. And nobody is talking about Turkish Stream, but I think it's a very, very important to talk about it. Uh, there is no European mechanism to stop it. It's only Russian-Turkish undertaking. It's going directly to Turkey, and from there, there is an option to go through the Balkans and to Central and Eastern Europe, and even Ukraine, but from the other end. That is something that could be prevented, though, this coming from, from Turkey up north. Um, the line to Turkey is fine. Turkey needs gas. It can have the Russian gas, but going to, to Europe is going to go into the Balkans is going to put even more dependence, uh, in more dependence, the countries in the Balkan region. And because of this encircling of Central and Eastern Europe by two major pipelines of uh, Russian gas, the countries uh, which are losing transit, losing transit income, losing uh, ability to negotiate as important countries, transit countries to Russian gas, uh, they are going to have a few options and they are going to suffer the most. First, they're going to be locked into Russian gas supplies. And secondly, they're going to have very limited ability for uh, alternative suppliers coming from west to east. If Russian gas comes from west to east, from Germany to Czech Republic, to Slovakia, to Hungary, and down to the Balkans, this uh, creates a completely different situation because the capacities of the pipelines from west to east are smaller and they are backlogged very often, unlike the capacities from east to, to west as it is now. Uh, and that's something that w we need to pay attention to because it's going to prevent the development of regional markets within Central and Eastern Europe, including from north to south, it's going to sabotage the Three Seas Initiative as well uh, that has been undertaken by Poland and other Central European countries and very firmly supported by Romania as well. There are 12 countries in, in that project. Uh, but uh, changing the direction of Ru even Russian gas supplies that they're currently receiving from east to west, uh, changing the direction from west to east, is going to create um, a lot less opportunities, going to cut off opportunities for alternative gas supply. Uh, and then they, uh, they have some points already that the European Union is talking that they need to work to prevent uh, uh, choke points of gas supplies from, from west to east in particular. So Russia has already bought, uh, uh, booked the capacities of uh, both Opal pipeline and the not yet built uh, Yugal pipeline for 15 years ahead. And uh, these are Russian supported or Russian founded companies that have booked those capacities for 15 years ahead. So who is going to supply alternative gas to the region if there are no, av no availability of pipelines to, to do that? Opal is c currently exempt from the third energy package for a few years until final decision comes uh, next year by European court. But right now, Russia can supply the full capacity of 55 BCM through Nord Stream 1. So the first myth is that the project is pu purely commercial and not political, and Vlad talked a lot about uh, that it is political, but the numbers also proving that the, the project is political. It is commercial for Russia as well. It's not just political, it is commercial. In the next 20 years, uh, Russian gas produced and available for export is going to double. Right now, uh, there is about 200 BCM of uh, uh, Russian gas available for export. This is the produced gas minus the consumed in Russia. In 2035, they predict to have 372. So from 198, which is currently, to 372. This is almost double. 
So where are they going to sell this gas? Right now, 90% of it goes to Europe. To China, uh, the pipeline that they're building to China is not progressing as, as fast and as well as, uh, as the Russians promoted at the beginning when the sanctions started being imposed in 2014. Besides, the capacity is really not that large. It's about 36 BCM, I believe. One of them, I mean, 36 compared to 372. So Russia is banking on raised European demand for gas to be able to sell its gas. Is this really true? If we look at the numbers, right now the European uh, Union in 2017 consumed 491 BCM of gas, which is historically the highest since the drop back in 2014. And 2010 was a high year, and then it started dropping down. So the, the, the first myth is that, that gas is a scarce community as, as a commodity, as Vlad explained, was well, not true. Russia is going to double its export uh, volumes. Secondly, the, um, uh, the gas demand in Europe will probably not go higher than it is now. Uh, BP is predicting that uh, energy consumption in Europe is going to be reduced by 11% by 2040. Within this energy mix, gas consumption is going to increase by only 1%, while renewable energy sources is going to increase by 160%. So the potential of renewable energy sources being used instead of coal, nuclear, and, and, um, and increased gas, uh, instead of coal and nuclear, is much higher than the potential of having more gas coming to Europe to be used. There are many reasons for that. There are industrial reasons, there are population reasons. As you know, it's, uh, Europe has aging population, and the, uh, many enterprises move to different geographical locations, so it's kind of normal to expect that the consumption is going to decrease. Production of gas in the European Union, in, the, in, the, in Europe, not only European Union, but also countries outside of the European Union, is also going to decrease by about 5%. So this is what Russia is banking on to fill that gap. But that gap doesn't need to be necessarily filled by Russian gas. There is the availability of LNG, there is um, um, the Southern Gas Corridor coming through, through, and as I mentioned yesterday at the forum, we need to really pay attention to what is happening with Turkmenistan and the availability of Turkmen gas to the European market and uh, help as, m as much as we can to make that possible because the Southern Gas Corridor is a scalable project. It can be ex expanded and increased and can be a really, a really good alternative not only for Southern Europe, but also directed north to Central and Eastern Europe and being part of the interconnectivity Northwest and the Three Seas project that uh, Central European countries are working on. It is a major, major source, major alternative source. Uh, I know that right now neither the United States nor the European Union wants to give more prominent role to Turkey to be a, a big major gas distribution country uh, because of uh, tensions with Erdogan and his uh, actions within Turkey. But we have to remember that pipelines last longer than a lifetime sometimes of any leader. Uh, they out outlast leaders and they, they outlast even, even lives. So uh, when we think about pipelines, we need to think in a very strategic way, not be confined by temporary political developments that could change. Uh, the availability of LNG has been uh, considered, uh, considered to be, uh, LNG has been considered to be too expensive for Europe. And Moscow has been saying, well, you know, it's expensive, it has to be tra um, transported, it has to be liquefied, it has to be degasified after that. So. The price is not bearable, not comparable to Russian gas at all. So uh, w there is no competition uh, with especially American LNG. It's too far away. First of all, it is going to be available in much bigger quantities very soon, and it's already happening. 
Secondly, the price changed last year. Putin was saying, well, you know, they have to have at least $6 per million British uh, thermal units in order to be competitive to Russian gas. And it's true, the price was $5.24 last year, last April in uh, 2017. But it is $7.81 this past April. So it, it's well, way profitable now for uh, American LNG companies to export gas to Europe and make really nice, not only margin, not only a good spread, but make a good profit. And, and this is the, the thing about LNG. Uh, it determines a price that is spot price, spot, uh, spot price in Europe that is going to determine the pipeline uh, gas prices as well. That's why Russia had to drop the prices for Lithuania and uh, had to drop the prices for most of the Eastern European countries because if you, if you remember this latest ruling by the European Court of Arbitration on Ukrainian Gazprom dispute, NAFTA gas and the Gazprom dispute, the, the court ruled that uh, Ukraine should pay gas at the price of the nearest, nearest liquid market which was much lower than the price that Ukraine was paying under contract with Gazprom. So the spot markets are take, taking over, and that, that price, that argument that Russian gas is going to be cheaper is not going to hold for long because it's not going to be cheaper. In fact, Russian gas right now is more expensive in most of the Central Eastern European countries than it is in uh, Western Europe, which is the price is determined by, by the spot markets, by the spot price. The other um, um, myth that the Russian uh, company Gazprom is using is that they don't have enough pipelines in Europe. They are in lack of infrastructure, and if this infrastructure is not built now, if Europe misses the chance to build Nord Stream 2, um, it's missing a chance to have cheap and reliable gas for a long time uh, to come. This is an uh, absolute lie. Looking at what Russia is delivering to Europe, point by point, the point of entry of Russian pipelines from uh, through Poland, through, Belaru through Belarus to Poland, through Ukraine to, to other countries, um, calculating all these capacities, Russia has about 100 BCM of free capacity, unused capacity right now. And 55 BCM is in Ukraine alone. Ukrainian network was used about 70% of its capacity l last year. Um, and it could be used to full capacity. It's used sometimes when other pipelines are being um, under maintenance. But with the capacity of 257 BCM, total for Europe, for European Union only, I'm not talking about Turkey, Turkey is another 16 BCM. Russia delivered to European Union 155 BCM of gas last year, 100 and, yeah, 155. So you have a, a really, a, a from, uh, sorry, 155 compared to 257 capacity, over, two, over 100 BCM capacity available almost two-thirds of what Russia is delivering. So where is the argument that there, is, there are no enough pipelines? The only argument is that they want to close down, completely shut down the transit through Ukraine, and there is absolutely no other explanation of uh, this argument. And when you look at the uh, graphs uh, showing uh, the uh, usage of the pipelines for Russian gas, you see Yamal Europe, very even usage, at the more or less the same capacity. You see Blue Stream the same, uh, even line. You see mm, Nord Stream 1, the same nice even line uh, that drops only in a period of maintenance. And you see Ukrainian network, and it's absolutely erratic. It's up and down and up and down and up and down, which means that Gazprom is constantly dropping the, the pressure on the pipeline delivering less gas, delivering more gas, delivering less gas, which puts an enormous pressure on, Europe, on uh, Euro Ukrainian um, uh, gas network. But it's also showing that this network is extremely resilient if it's able to withhold this and still deliver the quantities of gas 
that Ukraine has on the contract with European um, customers. Back in March, for example, Russia stopped, um, uh, cancelled um, suddenly a prepaid quantity uh, uh, volume of gas that was supposed to be delivered to Europe. And the Ukrainian uh, government had to shut down the schools for two days in order to deliver the necessary, uh, the con contracted gas to European customers and not appear again to be unreliable transit country. Uh, we need to remember that 2006 and 2009 gas crises were completely engineered by Moscow. We remember Putin stopping the, the gas on television in a, in a show of uh, political opposition to Ukraine because Ukraine was refusing to sell its gas network to Gazprom. Um, so these are, these are the main arguments the other argument I'm going to ask uh, Matt Breiser to talk, talk about is that U.S. opposes Nord Stream 2 because it wants to sell LNG to Europe. And this is the only reason U.S. is against Nord Stream 2. Um, uh, but before I, um, I uh, conclude this uh, very short presentation, I wanted to say that if you look at Nord Stream 2 and Nord Stream 1 together, 110 BCM, and the Turkish stream that is going to transit 32 BCM, that makes altogether 142. Russia delivered to Europe and Turkey 178. That leaves only about 30, 35 BCM of gas that are not going to go through Nord Stream and through Turkish stream. And they will probably continue going through Belarus and Yamal Europe uh, through Poland. They're not going to go through Turkey. Or maybe about 15 BCM will still go down from uh, to the, through the Trans-Balkan trans, uh, pipeline to Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey for a little while until, until the pipeline is built. But the traffic, the transit through Ukraine has absolutely no future. It's going to be um, preserved only in case, uh, in the cases when Russia maintains its other pipelines and needs Ukrainian network to, to pick the, the slack. But what is the point economically to maintain a huge network with 14 compression sta stations um, uh, in Ukraine just for seasonal usage of that, of that network? It's very important to understand the manipulation uh, here and to counter that manipulation because the most what Europe should be interested the most and in the United States as well is how to preserve Ukraine as a country that has leverage with Russia. It's not going to be taken easily uh, over completely if there is no tra Russian transit through, through Ukraine and also keep the international interest in Ukraine. If you have a country that is transiting gas, we're all very much more alert and much more careful and try to preserve peace and try not to allow a whole-scale war to, to take place. But this is why it's so important to find a way to stop uh, the pipeline. And I asked yesterday this question, and it's very simple. I want to, to see what are their lawyers in the, in the audience or people who know more about that. But if European companies, and right now there are 200 European companies from 17 countries that have already signed contracts on, South, on Nord Stream 2. Uh, although Nord Stream 2 is entirely Gazprom project, unlike Nord Stream 1, which has five other European uh, shareholders, Nord Stream 2 is 100% Gazprom. The companies that have uh, decided to finance it um, to, uh, to take the burden of the financing. This is not investment for shares. They cannot own part of, of uh, Nord Stream 1. Uh, that's thanks to Poland that raised the issue in European, uh, in European Commission, European Court, and it was decided that it cannot go, uh, go forward. These companies are only going to give money to Gazprom, and as Vlad said, and I consider this the biggest vulnerability of the project. It's going to be a lot more difficult for Russia to build the project with uh, money from the state reserve. It's completely different when you have 50% of the funding supplied by European uh, international financing. And here are the mechanisms to stop it. 
there is a law um, uh, that was adopted the bipartisan law last year that uh, concerns uh, pipelines uh, by American Congress. That law can be implemented to stop a pipeline project that is going against uh, one, European energy security, two, it's threatening the security of Ukraine and the Baltic states as well because it's going to limit their ability to function in a normal um, market which is open and free. Um, and, uh, and three, um, a, a project that involves sanctioned individuals such as Gennady Timchenko and the bank, Russian banker Rothenberg who have already signed contracts and they are working on the uh, on the uh, Nord Stream pipeline on the Russian on Russian territory. So how are we going to allow these European companies to work with sanctioned individuals and sanctioned companies? Uh, I remember when South Stream um, Bulgaria signed a contract with Timchenko to develop the um, um, to, to, to implement the project, to, do, to build the entire project in Bulgaria and Macedonia did the same thing for Macedonia. The American ambassador warned the Bulgarian companies that anyone who works with uh, Gazprom, uh, with sanctioned individuals, is going to be sanctioned too. So where is this warning now? We can do that, and we kind of don't use the mechanism that is readily available to just uh, say companies that are working, as we did with we, we do with Iran companies that are working with sanctioned individuals or sanctioned companies should be sanctioned too. I'll stop here and turn to Matt to talk about uh, U.S. perspective on the project. Great. Thank you, Margarita. Boy, if everything was already said with Vlad, now it's been more than already said. Um, you guys, your minds are amazing. You're so sharp analytically, uh, encyclopedic in your knowledge. Vlad, you laid out a, uh, a very thoughtful policy prescription for Poland beloved Poland and our NATO allies in, in Europe's east. Margarita, you've posed some key questions. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to uh, answer right from the beginning, but first I want to thank Jamestown, thank you, Glenn, you, Willem, Chairman of the Board, uh, Matt Chekai, uh, Jonathan Folks for, for bringing this together, for getting me here from Istanbul. Uh, I love these events because they really give me a chance to stretch my own mind. Uh, and figure out what I really believe after years and years of working on these issues uh, as the climate is constantly changing. And I, I guess I have the honor of introducing Secretary of State Naimsky later, so I'll, I'll hold those comments. But uh, uh, for what it's worth, he's one of my uh, foreign policy heroes from decades ago. <laughs> um, your question you posed to me, Margarita, yeah, is, is indeed a red herring that um, is the U.S. opposed, or the Russian side says, the U.S. is opposed to Nord Stream 2 only because the U.S. wishes to sell as much U.S. LNG in Europe as possible. I, I believe that red herring, uh, I don't know what, if the red herring answers itself or is contradicted by the other Russian claim that you mentioned that U.S. LNG is too expensive to compete with Russian gas. So those two things cannot be true at the same time, that U.S. LNG is too expensive, but that the U.S. opposes Nord Stream 2 only because uh, the U.S. wants to maximize LNG flows into Europe. I think the problem is actually President Trump's rhetoric, where, whereby while I personally strongly embrace his, his opposition to Nord Stream 2, he did in his speech in Warsaw, that, that landmark speech a year ago, July, make this point that U.S. LNG is the answer to Europe's uh, energy security woes. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to take all this information we've heard and uh, distill it or, or package it into a pretty simple three set of points uh, as to why I think Nord Stream 2 is a bad idea, and I hope the U.S. administration currently agrees. So one is that uh, there's no need for this additional infrastructure, as Margarita was talking about. Number two, as both Vlad and Margarita have discussed, Nord Stream 2 violates the EU's own principles of energy policy and, by the way, solidarity. Uh, and number three, the, the pipeline project risks and, in fact, does further export Russia's model of state-level corruption uh, to the heart of Europe, and it also emboldens Russia with regard to Ukraine. So I'll come back to all of those points. But for purposes of full disclosure about myself, those of you that I haven't had a chance to get to know in the past, um, I personally, just so you know where I'm coming from, I, I am strongly, I strongly disagree with President Trump's expressed disdain for NATO, uh, for the EU, for transatlantic solidarity. Uh, I, I, I hope those positions are softening, but I do embrace 
his challenge of bureaucratic conventional wisdom, uh, and as I said before, his opposition to Nord Stream 2. Now, I worked very close, well, I worked, actually, I did work pretty close with uh, President Bush 43 uh, on these issues, and I have to say, uh, he was not in favor of the U.S. opposing Nord Stream 1. And when our ambassador to Sweden at the time, Ambassador Wood, made some public statements, uh, he was actually uh, reprimanded uh, in private for coming out publicly against Nord Stream 1. So uh, in this case, the Trump administration is showing, I think, clearer uh, strategic wisdom and vision. Um, another direction I come from is a strong belief that and, and this is, I mean, I think everybody here believes it, that Russia, of course, uses European reliance on Russian energy supplies as a political tool. I, I don't, but I'm not saying that theoretically. I'm, I'm saying that from some sometimes jarring conversations I had in my previous life in the U.S. government working on these issues. There was a, one, one remarkable conversation I had with someone who at that time was first, first deputy foreign minister of Russia. And we were on a plane together flying back from Zagreb. We had spoken together at a conference. Uh, and he said to me, to make a long story short, he said, you know, you Americans can negotiate in a soft way. Uh, you can be accommodating and friendly because you know you are so strong. We, this is the first deputy foreign minister of Russia, right? Um, we know that we are weak, that Russia is a weak state compared to you and the European Union, so we must fight as hard as we can on issues where we enjoy a competitive advantage. And number one is energy supplies to Europe, specifically natural gas. We, we had been speaking together at a conference on European natural gas. Wow, amazing uh, candor, of course in private after a bunch of vodkas on the flight, but nonetheless. Uh, second such statement was when I was uh, way back when, this was probably 1999 or so, uh, early in my days uh, working together with many others in, in, in the US government to promote the Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline in the South Gap Caucasus gas pipeline, which has grown into, of course, the Southern Corridor. Um, at that time, the Russian envoy for Caspian Energy said to me, pulled me aside at a conference at Wilton Park in the UK. He said, you know, similarly, we are going to fight like crazy all of your efforts because it is in our Russian national interest to move as much gas from the Caspian through Russian pipelines as possible because that's good for us economically and it strengthens our interest over, over the transit states uh, and, and the purchasers thereof. Um, I, I, I don't see anything necessarily evil in that. I think that if you have monopoly leverage, monopoly power, you are unwise if you don't try to protect it. That's what Russia is doing. But you're maybe even more unwise if you're the, on the receiving end of that monopoly leverage and you don't take the steps necessary to protect your consumers and to make sure the market can function in a more liquid way rather than according to the whims of a monopolist or an aspiring monopolist. Um, that all said, I also believe Russia must be, it will be, the primary natural gas supplier to Europe for as far as we can see into the future. So the goal shouldn't be to keep Russian gas out. The goal should be, in my mind, to make sure when Russian gas comes in, it does so according to the rules of supply and demand, so market forces, and the rules of the European Union's, well, rules-based system. Um, uh, as Margarita and Vlad ha ha have described, again, one of my perspective is I fully share, is that, yeah, Russia is using both Nord Stream 2 and Turkish Stream in an economic, geoeconomic pincer uh, to undermine diversification of supply that is really at the heart of the EU's current energy policy. I see this and feel this a lot where I live in Istanbul and whenever, whenever I'm visiting Ankara, trying to uh, convince in my non-government roles, my former colleagues in the Turkish government that the way we see the world is the way it is. <laughs> there are plenty of entrenched interests, though, that, of course, in Turkey, as in Germany, don't, don't want to see it that way. Um, another direction I'm coming from is I, I don't see this all as a crisis. I think the European Union, the Commission, the member states, Poland with Baltic Pipe, with the Svinovistia FSRU, Lithuania, as you just mentioned, Margarita, with its own uh, LNG import terminal, has done a tremendous amount of work in the last decade or so by virtue of the third energy package, the natural gas directive, to protect itself against Gazprom's and Russia's aspirations uh, to be monopolists and to use their uh, energy supplies for political leverage. Um, but I do believe at the same time that the lack of an EU, a unified EU response to Nord Stream 2, as Vlad was talking about uh, with the case of Germany, it emboldens Russia, uh, especially in Ukraine, because that sort of accommodating behavior 
must and does minimize President Putin's own perceptions of costs of those sorts of behavior uh, as in Ukraine. Coming back to LNG, US LNG, I, I actually do believe that Russian pipe gas can, can always be cheaper than US LNG because all of that infrastructure that will now be hopefully not but in place with Nord Stream 2, with Turkish Stream, all the legacy pipelines from the Soviet era, those are sunk costs. Those are there. So from now on, um, once Nord Stream 2 is in place, Russian gas can be supplied to European consumers at the, at the operational cost of production. You don't have to then any longer pay off those capital expenditures for new infrastructure. To increase UNG, US LNG supplies, there will need to be new capital expenditures, huge ones, that will have to be, again, paid back uh, in the price of the gas in, in coming into Europe or, or wherever it comes. And by the way, there's been very little LNG from the US that's come to Europe because the economics have not been right. But the key point is, LNG, whether from the US or Australia or in the future Mozambique or, uh, or North, uh, North Africa uh, well, and South Africa, I mean Central Africa, uh, Nigeria, it is already providing a price cap. So while Russia has clearly used natural gas, natural gas pricing as a tool to punish those EU member states and NATO members like Lithuania who maybe moved ahead too quickly from Russia's perspective in implementing the EU's own policies and the third uh, energy package. Uh, with the availability of LNG now, the LNG price, the spot price that Margarita was talking about, is an effective cap. So that limits the degree to which uh, Gazprom can profit maximize and therefore extract uh, extra rent uh, from European consumers, which was a huge problem uh, before, uh, before these alternative gas supplies came in. So that's, that's my mindset. Um, so, okay, so first argument I want to make is that, and this will be brief, I promise you, no, there's no need for Nord Stream 2. Uh, and, and I'll be brief because the points have already been said. Uh, Russia's current gas export capacity is huge, right? Uh, this last year, Russia exported a, a record uh, of natural gas to the EU and to non-EU member states in the Balkans and to Turkey of 178.9 BCM, about, about yeah, 180 BCM. But as Margarita said, the existing export capacity is 269 BCM. So what that means is the utilization rate right now as we speak by Russia of the pipeline infrastructure it has sending gas to Europe is only about 67%. Um, second, Ukraine's transit pipelines, are they're in good technical uh, condition. Uh, 93 BCM were exported to the EU via Ukraine, 93, so about half of what Russia exported to Ukraine. Uh, to Europe was via Ukraine last year in 2017. Um, and as, well, I just re recall a, a, a discussion I had way back when at the State Department about 12 years ago. Uh, I saw Colin Cleary, Cleary come in, an old friend of mine. I don't think you were at this conversation, but it was Alexander Medvedev of Gazprom was describing to us the, the merits of, of Nord Stream 1 at the time. And I, I just asked him point blank, but why would you not instead invest in upgrading the, European, uh, the, the Ukrainian natural gas infrastructure, uh, eliminate the bottlenecks that were there, work with the US and the EU as the US and EU have pledged to do at their previous summits to get inside the Ukrainian natural gas system, force uh, reform through in exchange for a, a joint project that would allow the Ukrainian pipeline system to be operated jointly, Gazprom and the EU. Uh, he turned red, he coughed a few times, and he said, no, 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 it's just way more expensive to try to rehabilitate Ukraine's pipelines uh, rather than to build new infrastructure offshore. In other words, red herring, no argument at all. So again, Russia has sufficient export capacity for as long as anyone can see into the future to take care of the gas that'll go to Europe. Ukraine's transit pipelines are still fine. And finally, as Margarita said, there's no projected increase in EU gas demand as we look out to 2040, right? As, exactly, as BP has written in its annual energy outlook, uh, European Union energy consumption will actually decrease by 11 percent, by 11 percent by 2040, in case you missed that statistic when, when Margarita said it the first time. Uh, that's because renewables will increase projectedly by 160 percent. So what this all means is, again, in 2040, uh, so uh, 22 years from now, natural gas consumption in Europe is predicted to increase by only 1 percent. Why all this new Russian infrastructure then is needed? Um, and I'll come back to that uh, in the very end, why. Um, second argument against Nord Stream 2, 
deep in my own soul, is it violates the EU's own principles of energy policy and, and, and solidarity. Um, we, we all know uh, about the requirements for unbundling, diversification of supply under the third energy package. But if and when Nord Stream 2 happens, then 70%, 70% of all Russian gas exports to the EU will be via one route. That's Russia to Germany through Nord Stream 1 and 2, 70%. If you're uh, an Eastern European, th that's got to be a chilling thought, right? If you're a, a, a citizen of the Baltic states or Poland, I mean, Radek Sikorsky, when he was then defense minister, said something that many people thought was impolite. Minister Naimski will remember. He called uh, Nord Stream 1 the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop pipeline, right? Ooh, and people got very upset. How impolite. But gee, how impolite was it for Germany to go over the heads or behind the backs of four of its own NATO allies and go ahead and reach this agreement with Russia on a pipeline that bypasses everybody? Um, <clears throat> so um, the whole rationale for Nord Stream 1 and 2 is contrary to the notion of collective security that is at the core of the EU and not to mention uh, NATO. And then if we couple, if you couple Nord Stream 1 and 2 with Turkish Stream, which it's not only going, it, it, it's, it's, it's built, right? It's built. Uh, the question, and Bulgaria, as you said, Margarita, seems ready to build the interconnector, right, that will allow the Russian gas to come up from Turkey. Uh, is eager to do so. Boyko Borisov, really, the prime minister, really wants uh, Bulgaria to emerge as the other gas hub after Germany. So if and when that pipeline happens and, and the connection to the EU happens, I mean, then of, of all the gas that comes into the EU and Turkey, 90% will be via these two Russian routes, Nord Stream 1 and 2. And under the Black Sea to Turkey, either there are two pipelines. And there's the Blue Stream pipeline that comes to Turkey already from Russia and then Turkish Stream. So 90% of all the gas coming into Europe will come through two routes, Russia, Germany, and Russia, Turkey. That's utterly contrary to the European Union's own policy and, by the way, regulations and laws. Another point about why Nord Stream 2 contradicts European energy policy is that it strikes me that state aid is in play here by the Russian government. Um, the Russian government, in the case of Nord Stream 2, is subsidizing unneeded excess capacity, right? So Nord Stream 2, as I've been arguing and Margarita has, is additional capacity for which there, there's, there's no need. So it's excess. Um, and that state subsidized, okay, the, the five companies that, that are European companies participating are also providing some investment, but so is the Russian state. So the Russian state um, is providing subsidies to the benefit of one Russian state-controlled company, okay, and five EU companies who have their own upstream interests, upstream investments in Russia, and want to get their gas out, as, as Vlad was describing about Vintersal uh, earlier, and Aeon. So um, state aid by the Russian government is helping five companies get a sweetheart deal <laughs> and helping Gazprom lock in its market share, right, and expand Russia's own monopoly leverage uh, over the European Union to the detriment of the rest of the European Union. That, that, that doesn't seem to make sense at all. Um, and let's go back to Nabucco for a second. There are lots of reasons people s speculate why Nabucco died. And, and from my perspective at the time, kind of inside of the debate, both uh, here in Washington and in Baku, uh, the problem was that Nabucco was over-designed for the volume of gas available for export at that time, right? It was, it was too big. So the private companies said, well, we don't want to invest in this pipe that's too big because it's not going to be filled, so we're not going to be able to get our investment repaid for too long of a time, so it, does, it doesn't make sense to us. We're not going to be able to sell enough gas to, to recoup our investment, so we'd favor a smaller pipeline. So what happened? The government of Azerbaijan stepped in, and the government of Azerbaijan said, for strategic reasons, we will invest through Sokar in Tanakh. In a, essentially, that's the Turkish the Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkish piece of Nabucco. It's just that Nabucco now pretty much stops at the Turkish-Bulgarian border. And, and Azerbaijan did that for its own strategic reasons. Yes, that was state aid, but I think the European Union welcomed that move because this was a way to create excess capacity to work against the monopolization attempts, the attempts to stifle competition within the European Union that were being driven by Gazprom. So, um, yeah, so I, I would argue that is state aid in the case of what Russia is doing uh, to support Nord Stream 2, and state aid that works against the fundamental interest in increasing competition 
and, and decreasing monopoly leverage uh, within the European Union. Uh, and finally, I would argue that Nord Stream 2, or European support for it, violates core EU principles of the rule of law and equal treatment of all states, and, and in general, solidarity of EU member states. Uh, as you said, Vlad, Nord Stream 2 is strongly opposed by 12 EU member states, but it's actually opposed by, I guess, 20 overall, 20 of 28. Strongly supported by, wow, Germany, Austria, Netherlands. Why? Because their companies are investing in Nord Stream 2, right? And their companies will benefit from Russian state aid to reduce the cost of this excess capacity, which will help these European companies monetize their investments. Of course, it's commercial in their interests, but it's not commercial from the broader sense of how markets work. And France is thrown in there, too, probably because of Total's interests, uh, as you talked about before, up in Yamal uh, and, and no longer Stockmann. Um, sometimes, when I'm traveling around Europe, I hear um, our, our friends, allies, say, well, OK, but you know, maybe Nord Stream 2 is a good idea because Ukraine's transit route really isn't reliable. I mean, the Ukrainians, they've had all this instability. Um, uh, 2006, 2009, the gas flows were cut off to us. But that wasn't because of Ukraine's actions, right? There was Gazprom that cut off those gas flows. Yes, Ukraine's natural gas se sector was, was a disaster until this government came into power. The Poroshenko government has gigantic warts, huge problems, but one thing it did was to clean up Naftokhaz Ukraine and imp uh, implement some dramatic reforms. So, the natural gas sector in Ukraine used to be one of its most serious Achilles heels that, that, that Moscow exploited. And that's much more difficult to do now. So that, that, that's good. But let's say even, even if Ukraine really were still an unreliable gas transit route, uh, what happened to the core EU principle, the founding principle, the European coal and steel community, that countries that are in conflict, let's say France and Germany, need to bind themselves together through mutual dependence, right, on energy issues, coal, steel, industrial issues. If it was good enough of a principle to be a foundation of the entire European Union, why isn't that same principle valid today when it comes to Ukraine? Maintaining solidarity with Ukraine as it strives for inclusion in our tr European, or well, transatlantic community, uh, which will impose the same sort of rules, hopefully will lead toward more rules-based behavior by the Russian importer of natural gas, as happened, and, and mitigate the conflict between East and West, such as uh, happened uh, through the European coal and steel, steel community. Final set of points um, is that Nord Stream 2 helps to export the Russian model of state-level corruption and, and emboldens Russia when it comes to Ukraine. Um, we all know plenty of former boosters of the Southern Corridor uh, who, who now echo Putin's and Merkel's claims that Nord Stream 2, tr tr Nord Stream 2 is a purely commercial project. I think back to a former CEO of OMV. Uh, when we were, he was looking for support back then on Nabucco from the US government, who said to me, you know, when I, when I go and talk to uh, people in Gazprom, um, I find that there are uh, thousands of them who are just professional financiers, engineers, who want Gazprom to be a normal company, a company that invests in smart projects uh, that turn uh, a profit and are good for the company. But instead, the OMV, this was the OMV CEO said, so many of the Gazprom uh, people complain that they're forced to pursue politically motivated projects, and he specifically cited South Stream and Nord Stream 1, uh, which are actually quite bad for the bottom line of Gazprom. Um, and so why do they go ahead? Well, there's Vladimir Milov, you may remember, is a brilliant deputy, former deputy energy minister uh, of, uh, of Russia. He's now in the opposition. Uh, he told, uh, a hilarious story at one of our Lenark Mary conferences in Tallinn a few years ago. He said uh, when he was Deputy Minister of Energy, people in Gazprom would complain, there's so much corruption in Gazprom, we waste so much time, so much time developing projects that again, don't make commercial sense for us, but are there to provide for the kickback schemes mm -hmm. to Russian officials and, and high-level Gazpromians. So we joke in Gazprom, the guy said, <laughs> that we ought to just Give the kickback money straight away. Forget about the projects. Don't waste our time designing them. Don't waste our time trying to sell them politically. Just give the money to the corrupt officials and let us do our jobs. Um, and then finally, everybody knows uh, Chancellor Schroeder's story. Uh, what, you, what we didn't mention yet is that the, the largest loan guarantee yeah. ever offered, yep, in the history of Germany, was offered by Chancellor Schroeder a month before he left. And then once he left office, as we all know, joined the board of Nord Stream 1 
He's now worked his way up, and he's the chairman of the board of Rosneft as well. Um, <laughs> and then maybe the, the, the issue that really gets me the most is that um, the dividing and conquering that, that Gazprom and Russia have effectively done on Nord Stream to, as we've, as we've been discussing this morning, um, it facilitates parochialism, it facilitates the we first uh, mentality that allows Russia to divide and conquer. It's what you began your talk with, Vlad, when you say that Chancellor Merkel uh, has been pursuing Nord Stream 2 as a project that is strictly in the economic interest of Germany. And her policy, and German policy generally is, separate economics from politics. And that is an utterly artificial separation. We should all know that. Uh, the Russian government certainly knows that, that the, the two are bound together. Uh, and and I, I would think that Chancellor Merkel really knows it deep inside, but it's an inconvenient truth to recognize. You would have to work it cut against the grain of all the sort of regional lender and, 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 and German corporate interests in Nord Stream 2 happening. Uh, most appallingly is that this sort of spirit of partnering separately with Russia uh, behind the backs of the Baltic states, of Poland and of Ukraine, is utterly contrary to the spirit of the Normandy Group and EU efforts to hold Russia's feet to the fire uh, with regard to uh, Ukraine and the Minsk agreements. So the po potential U.S. role to, to wrap things up, uh, I don't think cheerleading for U.S. LNG is going to be the answer um, because economics are going to determine the markets for U.S. LNG, not, not political sloganeering, though, though, as Margarita said, uh, U.S. LNG will, will be increasingly uh, competitive. I think what the U.S. government should do is, is rally EU solidarity by highlighting your points, Vlad, by highlighting the points that I've just raised, by raising the visibility that this Nord Stream in the north, Turkish Stream in the south, geoeconomic pincer is, is taking shape. Um, in other words, the, it would be great if the U.S. could take an active lead on these issues, as it did in facilitating the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, the Southern Corridor. Um, so what's needed is solidarity, right? Solidarity, transatlantic solidarity. I fear that if the U.S. were to impose sanctions, that would work against solidarity um, and just feed into this tirade being uh, of trade wars and uh, undercutting the legitimacy of NATO and the EU. Um, so it, like everything else, it comes back, I think, to President Trump, but really comes back to those professionals uh, in the U.S. government, who we'll hear from later today, who see the world the same way, who are not a deep state, as President Trump has been saying, but are career officials who have decided to commit their lives, their professional lives, uh, to the well-being, to the national security, security of the U.S. in solidarity with our allies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, just one uh, quick comment. Um, what we hear the numbers about uh, Russian gas export. Uh, Russians measure BCM in a different, under different temperature and different pressure. So the Gazprom would list that they have exported a record of 194 BCM. It's actually 178. It has to be reduced by almost 8% to fit the European measure of uh, percentage and temperature. And the other thing is talking that gas is going to be uh, decreased, uh, increased by only 1% in the energy mix in <coughs> 20 years actually increased by 1% in an energy mix that is decreased by 11%. So it's going to be actually less gas than we consume now. Thank you. We'll close the, uh, do, do we have time for questions? Yes, please, couple of questions we can take here. We have a busy second panel with a lot of great speakers, but yes, please, Anthony. My name is Anthony Livanius with US Energy Stream. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations to Glenn Howard and the Jamestown Foundation as the most sophisticated event that I've been here in Washington on Nord Stream Pipeline in the last year. So amazing work, congratulations. And of course, a dream team in the panel talking about the Nord Stream Pipeline. As all three of you know, I live in Germany for 10 years and I have also initiated the Frankfurt Gas Forum. So I have a question that relates with the German gas industry and what the German gas leaders think about Nord Stream, and I would like your view. German gas leaders today think that the market 
is different, which means much more liquidity, much more gas in form of LNG, much more unified European gas market. And what German industry says is that if you circle around that region, where is you know, Germany, Austria, Netherlands, UK, France, Northern Italy, Switzerland, this accounts for 80% of the entire gas demand, gas consumption for Europe. So what German industry claims is that today, the gas that will come from Nord Stream to pipeline cannot dominate the market the way Russian gas could have dominated the German and the Central European market 10 years ago. And the German gas leader, BASF, glad you've mentioned, E.ON, Uniper, that supports the Nord Stream pipeline, is one of the investors. Uh, believe that US LNG and shale gas revolution has played a huge role and had a huge impact on the gas uh, agreements and commercial agreements in, in, in Europe uh, and especially in Germany because you know we've seen in the last three years you know that that the gas from gas price has been declined and this is the uh, reason of the US shale gas revolution and many in Texas and Oklahoma that nobody believed them 10 years ago that they would create the shale gas revolution. They believe that they will sell US LNG to Europe. And today what they say is that the Henry Hub price is $3 and the TTF price that the Germans buy is $8. So what do you, all three of you, that's a question to all three of you, what do you say, what do you think about what German gas leaders say today about the liquidity of the gas market. What do you think? What is your opinion? Thank you very much. Let's go to okay, Matt. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, your um, Frankfurt Gas Forum is one of the key events on the calendar, and, and congratulations to you for creating the first such event uh, five, six years ago. My, my honor, truly. Uh, m my argument would be that, uh, of course, they're right, but th they're, those German industrial leaders are talking about their own interests, right? I mean, they were also happy to partner with Gazprom long before this increased liquidity in German markets happened. Uh, and it's the, the points that, that I raised are, are, are not addressed by what they're saying, right? I, so I, I don't think there's any commercial need for this additional infrastructure. It's just a sweetheart deal uh, that's relying largely on Russian state aid, which is not legal as far as I understand in the European uh, Union context. Plus, the project builds those, deepens those sorts of uh, uh, patterns of cooperation that are shady, that are Schroederian, um, that are importing more of this relationship, mutual dependency of, corrupt, of corruption that is, uh, that is caustic, I think, for Germany and, and, and the European Union. So just because German or European industrial leaders want something doesn't mean it's a good idea for all the European Union. That's why there's regulation, right? And that's why there are rules and the rules need to be followed. But, but, but economically, yeah, I mean, it, it is to their advantage for Russian gas to come. And then on US LNG, indeed, yeah, that, that's the same point I was trying to make, that US LNG is providing a price cap or LNG is providing a price cap. Gazprom has to reduce its price but it can go down a lot further if it wants to maintain market share, right? Because the, 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 cost of, the marginal cost of producing Russian gas is so low and they don't have to liquefy it. Thank you. Does Germany pay less for the gas that it receives from Nord Stream 1? The last contract I remember that was kind of made public was $440 per million cubic meters. And the Bulgarians managed to get to that price as well from almost 600 that they were paying at the time, and they're still paying about 400 and maybe 50, 60 dollars per million cubic meters. This is way, way too high for any country to pay since the actual price is under 200. So I don't think Germany is paying less for gas um, coming to Nord Stream 1. The other thing is these pipelines, and this is a good point that uh, we're not raising enough, they can be used for installing of a, uh, of a 
cables, uh, fiber uh, cables uh, uh, that can be used for listening as listening devices and spying devices to throughout the Baltic Sea. And this is not a topic that's been, been discussed enough from a technical point of view of what, what actually is happening. Just there is the potential that Russians have been installing cables under pipelines and are along pipelines elsewhere. And that could be another option to, um, uh, to undermine um, our European allies. The argument about liquidity does apply to Western Europe, but it does not apply, certainly not to the same extent, to the countries situated eastward of Germany. Those would remain completely dependent uh, on Russian supplies, and Nord Stream 1 and 2 enable Russia to supply directly Western Europe, while at the same time cutting off countries situated eastward of uh, Germany without affecting Western Europe. So it's a device of, uh, or an instrument of divide and rule and of weakening solidarity. To pick up on the points that, uh, very valid points that uh, Margarita made, the potential of Nord Stream 1 and 2 to become a physical obstacle to NATO operations in the Baltic Sea in a crisis situation. This could become a physical obstacle. It could even justify Russian preemptive measures to deploy forces to protect these extremely valuable assets in the event, in a pre-crisis situation, not in a fighting situation, in a pre-crisis -pre situation. So this will greatly complicate NATO's plans to reinforce the Baltic states in a pre-crisis situation. Thank you. So we'll wrap up. We're going to wrap, uh, wrap it up and start with the second panel immediately or take a little? OK. Oh, so we, we do have time. OK, 12.30. No, no, we have to have lunch now. Yes, I understand. <laughs> I understand. We have, we, have the, we have time for lunch. OK, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to our panelists. <laughs>